from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, a tribute to renowned K-State agricultural policy specialist Barry Flinchball, who unexpectedly passed away yesterday. An overview of his outstanding career as a much sought after advisor on agricultural policy and as a teacher to thousands of students over nearly half a century. That's coming right up. Also on the latest edition of FSA Coffee Talk from the Farm Service Agency, David Shem will provide an update on an assortment of USDA program activity ongoing in Kansas, including the latest numbers on the CFAP payments. And further ahead, K-State's Charlie Lee discusses the increasing interest in crossbow hunting of deer. That and more ahead on this Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today from the campus of Kansas State University. And it's essential that we lead off with this today. When things like this happen, and they do to all of us, knowing what to say and the manner in which to say it does not come easy. The challenge is in doing justice to the individual you're speaking about. So here goes. Kansas Agriculture lost a true friend yesterday, and you only have to say the name, Barry Flinchbaugh, to know what that means. Over the past 24 hours, these words have been used routinely. Icon, institution, legend, also colorful, candid, that's for sure, dynamic, outspoken, charismatic, and unfiltered, among many others. The one description that probably meant the most to Barry, teacher. Barry was in the midst of his 49th year of teaching the agricultural policy class at K-State. During that tenure, well over 4,000 students, some multi-generational, gained from that classroom experience. Barry's often stated goal in recent years was to teach that 50th year, which would have been next year, and sadly, that goal will be left unfulfilled. One of the rare, rare times that Barry ever fell short on his objective. Originally from the family farm near York, Pennsylvania, Barry was a very proud two-time graduate of the Pennsylvania State University, what we know as Penn State. After earning his doctorate in agricultural economics at Purdue, he arrived at K-State in 1971 as Extension Agricultural Policy Specialist. At one time, he took a break from that duty to be an assistant to then Kansas State University President Dwayne Ocker, but then returned to Extension and Agricultural Economics after serving a few years in that post. In 2004, he retired from Extension but Barry continued teaching agricultural policy at K-State right up to the present. And of course, his prowess in agricultural policy made him a national expert in the field. He was sought out by countless policymakers at the state and national levels, chairman of the House and Senate Agriculture Committees, secretaries of agriculture, and even the occasional president. One of the hallmarks came in 1996 when he was named the chairman of the newly formed Commission on 21st Century Production Agriculture. That was a product of the 1996 Farm Bill. He had been involved to some degree in every U.S. Farm Bill since 1968, and he served on scores of national boards, advisory groups, task forces, and more as a valued resource on domestic food and agricultural policy. The accolades can roll on and on, and they most assuredly have been over the last 24 hours plus. 
Of course, Barry was a regular here on Agriculture Today during his extension years and even some after that. So that we might reflect a bit here on the essence of Barry Flinchbaugh, here's part of his last appearance on this broadcast. Aired in August of 2018, it's a recording of a session that Barry and yours truly conducted on the making of the 2018 Farm Bill, this at the 2018 K-State Cooperative Symposium here on the campus. And the theme was one of Barry's favorites, bipartisanship. Pat Roberts and Debbie Stabenow in the Senate, the chair and the vice chair of the Senate Ag Committee have produced a farm bill that will work, get the job done, basically keep the payments intact, keep the conservation programs intact, keep food programs in the farm bill, uh, meet the budget, uh, and all we need to do is pass that Senate bill out of conference and put it through the House and the President will sign it and uh, we'll have a good farm bill and we may actually get it done on time. But Senator Roberts and Senator Stabenow who worked together, who did the farm bill under regular orders, which is how it's supposed to be done by Senate rules, Both have caught hell from their leadership because they get along. You're not supposed to get along anymore. You're supposed to fight. You're supposed to do what they did in the House. Do you realize the House passed the first partisan farm bill in history? The first farm bill, going back to the 20s, that did not get one vote from the other party. Now, what we can do now, and I think they understand this, we can adopt the Senate version in conference, and the Speaker will put it through the House with regular Republican votes without the Freedom Caucus and Democrat votes, and we can get this done. I think that's where we're headed. There's one issue, one major issue, And that's work requirements for food stamps. And I got in a real argument with the the Texan because when he started on the farm bill, he argued that we should take food stamps out of the farm bill. Now, if you can add, you'll understand this. There's 435 congressmen. There's 35 that are rural. Now, who needs who? You can't pass a farm bill without urban votes. And how do you get urban votes? Food programs. As Bob Dole said many years ago when they put food stamps in the farm bill and he called hell for it, he kind of, you know, in the Dole fashion, cocked his head and grinned and said, food and agriculture, is there a connection? There's a point of clarification, Barry. We talked about this before we came up on the work requirements related to SNAP. Yeah. There are work requirements related to SNAP right. as is. Exactly. The Freedom Caucus wants to increase them. Now, why would you oppose that, especially if you're from farm country? Why did Roberts oppose it? I mean, he caught some hell for it. Well, as he said, I need 60 votes. And I can't get 60 votes if I increase those work requirements. So that's why they didn't. It's not a simple majority. Now, the compromise will be they'll do some window dressing. And they'll um, increase some work requirements minor then they'll get democrat votes in the in the house and we'll put it all together i think robertson stabenow deserve a tremendous amount of credit for 
doing it the old-fashioned way. And they meet each other in the middle. Again, that from August of 2018. All of us who knew him, to whatever degree, can hark back on so many things. Those who knew him well, each one has a flinchbaugh story, or two, or more to tell. That voice, and that style, the knack for showmanship as a gifted speaker, the unlit cigar that accompanied him for years upon years, until doctor's orders put that stogie and its nicotine on the shelf for good, in more recent years then, the cane. Many have been on the receiving end of a, a good poking from that cane after serving up a good ribbing of berry. It really is a cruel irony in that here we are on an election day and uh, his perceptions on the results of this election once the tally was in would likely have been epic. We'll now never know. That knowledge, that wisdom, that commitment to agriculture... His like will not come along again. And there really are no words other than K-State, Kansas agriculture, and too many friends and acquaintances to count have lost a friend, and maybe even more importantly, a leader. At many, many seminars and events, Barry was asked to give his presentation on kings and kingmakers. And he never would concede this, but make no mistake... Barry Flinchbaugh was a kingmaker of the most extraordinary kind. And lastly, the very best thing that each and every one of us can do to honor his legacy today is this simple. If you haven't done so already, get out and vote. Professor Emeritus in Agricultural Economics at Kansas State University, Dr. Barry Flinchbaugh, passed away yesterday from health complications, he was 78 years old. This is Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. We're back now on this Agriculture Today, and every other Tuesday, as you know, we get together with folk from the Farm Service Agency State Headquarters to brief you on what's going on with USDA programs here in Kansas called the FSA Coffee Talk. And along with us here is the State Executive Director of the Farm Service Agency in Kansas, David Shim. We have a selection of updates to provide here, David, which we'll get to, but you did want to convey some sentiments on the part of yourself and the Farm Service Agency concerning the passing of our good friend, Barry Flinchbaugh. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, it was uh, with uh, great chagrin and remorse that I uh, heard that uh, Dr. Flinchbaugh had passed us. And, and as I thought back about the many memories that I've had and the impact that he has had on, on truly so many people within ag, ag leaders, uh, it's just uh, a great loss truly to Kansas, and, and it's beyond Kansas. I would say it's to the whole ag industry. Uh, I've had the opportunity to reach out to friends uh, actually from around the country and, and a lot of remorse in, the, in truly the passing of this icon and the impact. And then I would say the very positive impact that he has had on ag and ag policy. You know, it's a farm service agency. Many of our uh, programs that we implement out there for our producers, uh, he was a key component in helping to craft and helping to shape that that policy that uh, actually we're carrying out to those producers. So a great loss, a great loss uh, for me personally, being able to engage with Dr. Flinchball, uh, several different levels, several different conferences. Uh, I always remember some uh, meetings and him always talking about kings and kingmaker uh, discussion. Uh, truly a, a great man for our time, and we really were blessed for uh, having him uh, for this time we did. Well put, and thank you for those remarks. They are appreciated and most appropriate. 
Well, let us know about a few things here, if you would, out of the FSA confines. You have an update on the enrollment for agricultural risk coverage or price loss coverage for the coming year, the uh, production year 2021, right? Absolutely. So, you know, here just uh, starting uh, the beginning of uh, this last month, October, we started issuing those payments out to our producers. And remember, for our ARC PLC payments, they're always that one year behind. So where we started actually issuing out was the 2019 ARC PLC payments. And so, you know, here at the end of the month, we had already issued out, Eric, almost $445 million to producers across the state. Um, But during, obviously, that time when those payments going out, we've also... Uh, had producers starting to sign up for 2021 ARC PLC. Again, remember, this is a change from the last farm bill that we were under, the new farm bill, when uh, producers initially enrolled. They enrolled for either the ARC or the PLC program for the 19 and 20 year. But again, starting for the 21 year, it's a yearly enrollment that producers will be selecting here. So, you know, kind of looking at past numbers and where we've been, in 2020, we had about 103 uh, farms enrolled in the state uh, for our producers for our ARC and PLC contracts. Uh, We're just getting started this year for 2021. We've had a little over 9,000 enrollments. Offices are busy getting producers signed up here. So, you know, uh, again, with the current situation of of the pandemic and COVID uh, impacting offices, I would encourage producers to reach out to your uh, local office, uh, make an appointment or contact, work with them, and making sure you get your operations signed up for the ARC PLC. And they've time to do this yet. There's no pressing deadline at the moment, but you'd like to see them squared away nonetheless. A- absolutely. And, and offices are really busy. And as we kind of go through these summaries, Eric, I'll point out and, and people will quickly realize how busy our office is out there. But yeah, producers still have time to be able to get signed up, but uh, encourage, obviously, work with the local offices, reach out to them, uh, get an appointment scheduled that'll work for you and them. All right. Well, on another topic, The Coronavirus Food Assistance Program phases one and two. Well, one's still out there, but two is active as well. What numbers are you seeing there, David? Well, you know, when CFAP 2 was released, and then we've had some additional policy that's kind of actually tied back in just a little bit for some producers to CFAP 1. You know, it closed out. We had 32,000 applications, a little over $460 million dispersed in that program there. CFAP 2, you know, we've already had 49,000 applications on that uh, with $437 million uh, issued out on that. So, again, those are some significant numbers. You know, one of the things I think I really ought to highlight, and a little bit of what I was talking about earlier, Eric, with our offices, been just doing an outstanding job servicing our producers out there and trying to help our producers here. Uh, but, you know, in, in CFAP 1 applications, Kansas actually is seventh in the nation in what we've issued out there. In CFAP 2, we're actually fifth in the nation already. And uh, even when we talk about such things as ARC PLC, it's kind of amazing, but uh, Kansas ranks fourth in the nation for the number of uh, enrollments we have within ARC PLC. So, you know, when you kind of pull this all together and we look in the year and kind of, uh, how would you say, that rearview mayor and kind of glance data, we've, we've issued uh, right at $2.4 billion in payments to our producers across the state. So, again, it just shows you the impact that our, our producer has in the state and, and what they truly do for our nation. All right. And those who have yet to apply for CFAP2 are still inclined to do so. Anything that they need to know about in, in as far as the mechanics of that David? So that program, one of the things that we really emphasized to try to help out was to be able to utilize the available data that FSA had or could be able to get, uh, in, as in working with RMA, uh, those various insurance, uh, to be able to pull that data in there. So actually our CFAP2, uh, the biggest thing from a producer standpoint, of course we have the website, farmers.gov. It's a great resource for to be able to go in there, actually kind of initialize that uh, application if they want to, but it also has an FAQ you know, frequently asked questions to help producers kind of walk through data they will they will need there. But truly, it's it's pretty easy. Get a hold of that local office, talk to them, and be able to walk them through that. Again, CFAP two covers a large uh, large area there, whether they're you know producers of fruits and vegetables or specialty crops. Uh, also, can go clear into wool, land production, livestock production, uh, and of course to our, our commodity row crop 
type producers as well. So a lot of different areas that CFAP2 does cover for those producers. So again, reaching out to that local office, contacting them, go to farmers.gov will really help them to narrow down to their specific operation. Get those questions answered as much as you can before you go in, and that'll smooth the process. David, you also had some brief comments on USDA loans through the FSA, a recap of fiscal year 20. Absolutely. You know, that's one of the things that uh, I've definitely made a priority uh, underneath my tenure to look at and make sure that our loan division is is truly out there helping the needs of those producers out there, not just the producers that need that help, but also our, uh, you know, socially disadvantaged producer, our beginning producers. You know, those are some of the keys to a really diverse and uh, continuing robust heritage that we have out there for ag. So this last year, to say the least, has been a very busy year. And what continually amazes me is when I look within the challenges that we have had, obviously working with COVID, uh, you know, a lot of times that loan making that, a lot of that goes to, you know, interaction with that customer and and helping to build that loan portfolio for them. And we've been able to do it uh, virtually, albeit there's been challenges, but we've been able to do it virtually to the tune of uh, we've actually uh, increased uh, our loan amounts by 130% for the year. Um, Our number of borrowers up almost 4% from last year. Uh, so again, just some uh, huge, huge numbers when we when we look at with the challenges we've been uh, dealing with this year here. So I mean, right now, our total loan portfolio for the state for FSA is right at $1.2 billion. So that's, you know, the amount of outstanding loans we have with producers helping them out there to purchase that land or necessary equipment and, and, and to put that crop in and, and take care of those livestock. And we're a month plus into fiscal 21, so USDA loan business is open as well right now. Yep, absolutely. We continue to work with producers out there that are needing help. Again, if you're uh, in that situation where you uh, think you uh, need that help, reach out to our offices. Uh, One program that I I, I should mention, uh, kind of a unique program that I always like to promote as well, is our Farmer Storage Facility Loan, Eric. Uh, You know, that's one that some of our other loan programs for uh, a lot of producers tends to be a little bit more needs-based, and there's some qualification criteria. Uh, however, our farm storage facility loan is not. It's uh, it's available to uh, everyone out there. Uh, very low interest uh, uh, loan. Uh, in fact, I think right now the current rate is actually sub two percent. So. Mm-hmm. Many times people think about just bins. It's not just bins. It's also uh, obviously, you know, a, a grain leg, various things like that. But this can also go clear down into uh, some of those producers who are utilizing bagging machines, possibly uh, grain carts. It's a lot of things that these loans can really uh, be able to do that. We've seen uh, some huge increase uh, from the statewide perspective. Uh, you know, I've got some areas uh, within the state that actually they're running about triple the interest of they ha- have in the past year. So incredible growth in our storage loan. So we definitely encourage producers to reach out on the farm storage facility loan as well. Well, again, one of the strongholds of those local FSA offices is that those folks there are well-versed in all these matters. So producers, keep that conversation going with your local FSA office and uh, tap them for more information on any of these programs as you would show interest in them. David, it's always a pleasure to get caught up on USDA activities in Kansas. Many thanks to you. Thank you, Eric. On this FSA Coffee Talk, David Shem, the State Executive Director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas. After this break, Agriculture Today will return with more here on the K-State Radio Network. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. And to follow up here, for many out there may be wondering, this was passed along to us just a few moments ago. 
In accordance with family wishes, there will not be a formal funeral service for Barry Flinchball. There will be a private family burial and then a celebration of life. That'll take place sometime after the pandemic. Now, Barry's wife, Kathy, says that if you're wondering what you can do, you can contribute to the Flinchball Scholarship Fund or the Flinchball Agricultural Policy Chair, both here at Kansas State University, or you can give to a charity of your choice in Barry's name. And when that celebration of life is finally scheduled, of course, we will pass along all the details to you at that time. In the latest Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report out from the USDA for the week ending this past Sunday, still quite dry, to say the least, around Kansas. Topsoil moisture, 4% surplus, 34% adequate, and still 62% short to very short. And the subsoil, 1% surplus, 37% adequate on moisture, and 62% short to very short there. The condition of the Kansas winter wheat crop is at 28% good to excellent, 49% fair, and 23% poor to very poor. Planting now 95% done. That's slightly ahead of the average of 90% for the date. And uh, winter wheat emergence in Kansas, 77%. The average for the date is 71%. For the record, corn harvest 90% done. Soybean harvest 83% complete. And the grain sorghum harvest is now 74% complete in Kansas. Winter wheat planting nationally is proceeding at a good pace, but there is below-average emergence, we hear now from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey notes that winter wheat planting is slightly ahead of last year's rate. The thing to note is that several states across the plains and the northwest still dealing with the impact of drought. So we see in those states ahead-of-average planting progress but below average emergence, which is suggestive of not only the drought, but the more recent cold weather. He points to one example. So kind of the the poster child for this problem is Oregon at this point, dealing with some very serious drought in the northwest. Meanwhile, winter wheat condition overall improved slightly from last week, but five states have at least one-fifth of their crops rated in very poor-to-poor condition. It's worth noting that for this point in the season, this is the lowest overall winter wheat condition that we have seen in the country in this century going back 20 years. So it is a a tough start, even with the moisture that we saw last week across the central and southern plains. That report from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. Now it's on to this week's edition of Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook standing by. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning lameness in your dairy herds. As we come to this time of the year, this is the time when some of the uh, issues that actually started back in the summer start showing up on the soles of the animals in your uh, dairy herd. As we think about our hoof trimming and we think about some of those reports that may be coming across your desk if you're the herd manager, you're probably seeing an increase in some of the lesions as a result of things that happen during the summertime. Heat stress generally increases our chances that we'll see things like white line disease or sole ulcers. The important thing to note is that it's usually about 60 to 90 days after the actual insult that we actually see it when we're trimming animals. So again, this time of year we start to uh, see those generally increase in our herd. The thing I want you to think about is the cost of that. You know, there's been several studies that have been published that have looked at the cost of lameness in our dairy herds, and actually it's quite expensive. A lot of times we think about it in terms of how much milk we lose because those animals that are lame do produce less milk each year. And there's a variation in, as you look at the research studies, in the amount of that milk. But it could be as much as 1,300 or maybe 1,500 pounds per cow that is actually lame. So let's say you have 300 cows in your herd and 15% of those have lameness sometime during their lactation. That could be somewhere between 8000 and 9000 per year in your herd. So that's just on lost milk. But there's other things that are important as we think about lameness. When we look at the actual annual cost of lameness in our dairy herd, only about 24% of the total cost is actually associated with the reduced milk yield that we get from our animals. Another 24% is related to early culling. 
and 39% is actually related to reduced fertility. You see those animals that are lame, particularly early in lactation, they will generally become pregnant later in lactation than those animals that do not. In fact, generally we add about 30 days to the days open on those animals that are lame early in lactation. Obviously, if they get pregnant before they have the laminitis issue, it's generally not an issue. Most of the time on the dairy, uh, we're concerned about the cost of treatment. But really, the cost of treatment is a small portion when you compare to the loss in milk production, the increased culling cost, as well as the losses on fertility. So while we see that cost and increased trimming and those sorts of things are real things or things that we may not be thinking about. So when you look at the annual cost by lesion, that's an interesting thing to look at. Soul ulcers account for about 56% of our total cost. Ooh, that's something that probably started during the summer in most cases. White line disease, another 25%. Digital Lameness, not associated with white line, about 17%. And digital dermatitis is only 2%. So a lot of times we get concerned about the hairy warts in our herd. And yes, that's an important issue if we do have a problem. But when you look at the actual annual cost by lesion, maybe we ought to be more concerned about things like soul ulcers and white line disease. Again, things that are associated with issues with heat stress, so doing a better job of keeping our cows cool during the summer would probably reduce those issues on our dairy farms. So, question I want you to think about is if you're seeing issues of soul ulcers and white line disease as you review the hoof trimming records of your dairy herd, Maybe you should think about how you might prevent that in the first place, and that would go back to management of the feed bunk during the summertime as well as cow cooling. And if you look at the savings you would have if you had fewer problems with these two items, it would probably help provide some of that money that's needed to pay for those extra measures. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Many thanks, Mike, as always. Our weekly wildlife management segment is up next. K-State's Charlie Lee standing by for that. This is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Rounding out this agriculture today, it's our weekly segment on wildlife management. Aboard once again is wildlife specialist Charlie Lee, K-State Research and Extension. Well, Charlie, today, a closer examination of the use of crossbows for deer hunting, which is an option picking up steam, you say, out there. Yes, there are a few discussions that polarize hunters as much as vertical bow hunters and crossbow hunters. For whatever reason, it seems to cause a lot of controversy and a lot of discussions can be had over which method of hunting deer is acceptable during the archery season. The vertical bow hunters have had their own specialized season primarily in the rut during many of the state's hunting seasons. And then firearm hunters typically come on after the peak of the rut. Now, with the use of crossbows being allowed in Kansas for several years, there will be people that are concerned that allowing a a more efficient means of taking deer uh, is reducing the quality of the herd and making it too easy, and perhaps they should not be able to carve out some of the days during the archery season. So the the questions become, should we have a specialized crossbow season, or should we allow crossbows, or should it only be vertical bows? And when you look at all of those issues, should we allow compound bows? Uh, What about just uh, wooden, home-built bows? We've continued to come up with new equipment to make perhaps easier for hunters to harvest animals since mankind began chasing animals. And if the biological changes are insignificant or no difference, 
I think that we should be open to allow new types of equipment to be utilized. But there, the question then becomes there's not very much data yet. Mm. Well, there's starting to be some data. And in an article by Kip Adams uh, early in September of this year, detailed some information about crossbow hunting across the United States. Let's get into that information and the trends that we see in crossbow hunting and maybe weave into that this efficiency question, why crossbows are considered more so than your typical compound bow. Well, in the 37 states that are east of the Rocky Mountains, and those that are home to about 97% of the whitetails in the United States, 30 of those 37 states allow crossbows to be used by hunters at least during a portion of the archery season. All of the states in the southeast United States allow crossbows during the archery season. There are some states in the northeast in the New England region that do not allow them, but about half of the Midwestern states allow the use of crossbows. The percentage of Deer taken uh, during the national deer harvest that is taken with archery equipment that would include both vertical bows and crossbows is about 15%, or that's what it was in 2002. By 2012, that percentage has increased to 21%. So you can see that bows, both vertical and crossbows, are becoming more popular or being used more frequently and are responsible for more deer being taken. But it's only increased slightly since 2012. Rifles and shotguns still take about two-thirds of the total harvest annually, and that hasn't changed for the last 10 years. What's changed is the percentage of the archery harvest that's done by crossbows. There are some states that don't separate data from vertical bows and crossbows, but in those that do, the crossbow harvest now exceeds the vertical bow harvest. Nine Midwest states allow crossbow hunting, but crossbows only exceed vertical bow harvest in about three of those states. So it's still a lot of data out there. It still seems to be a new technique that's not universally accepted in in all states by all hunters, but it is very popular. Uh, Wisconsin uh, is one of the three states in the Midwest that has decided to do a comprehensive evaluation of crossbows for deer hunting because their concern there was that crossbow hunters were shooting too many bucks during the rut and crossbows were responsible for a decline in gun license sales. So they did a good survey project, surveyed state wildlife agencies in 19 different states, and it showed um, participation in hunters using crossbows has been on the rise in the states that allow their use. So in a time where we're seeing a decline in the number of hunters, I'm all for supporting a project that allows new hunters to enter into this sport. Uh, I don't think that it should matter whether they're using crossbows or vertical bows. Uh, Most states that allow for crossbow use allow it for the entire season. Crossbow use typically increased over the initial year, and then it kind of levels off. So we get some new hunters into the sport, and then basically it stays the same. Most states haven't really uh, determined if the use of crossbows uh, had any influence on their overall deer license sales. They didn't cause any difference in the total number of deer that are harvested, but the success rate has improved. The success rates in Ohio averaged about 21 percent uh, with vertical bows, and then that jumped up from up to as much as 28 percent with crossbow harvest. In Missouri, The bow success rates averaged about 31%, while crossbow success rates averaged about 35%. So that's a pretty high success rate, and I think that in those states where deer perhaps are easier to harvest than some of the others, there's really no need at all to be concerned about the use of vertical bows versus crossbows. We need to get all hunters together to try to support the activity rather than marginalizing some of those that are using perhaps non-traditional equipment. 
But keep in mind, crossbows have been around for hundreds of years. And now that they've carved out a place and a classification in some states, I think it's time to put this controversy behind us and, and accept them and welcome them into the deer hunting world. Well, good observations to consider there on the option of crossbow hunting of deer. Charlie, as always, much obliged. That from Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. So goes our Tuesday edition. We appreciate you tuning in and hope you'll rejoin us right here this same time tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.